Hello and welcome to another episode here on Captain's Dry Dog. And in the Dry Dog today, I'll be making the Star Trek The Next Generation Type 2 Phaser with light and sound effects. Let's make it real. Let's start with step one. And the most important part of any build is research, research, research. Now, back in the 80s and 90s, it was really hard to get research, meaning the fact that I had to use books like this. If some of you kids don't know what a book looks like, that's what it is. And also a very small low def screen to be able to pause my VHS or Betamax at the time to actually look at the prop I want to mimic, which was really, really difficult. However, even though it's got easier with the internet, sometimes it still can be quite difficult as well because there are so many pictures out there and everyone's got an opinion. So you're going from pillar to post, not knowing what's gonna be accurate. But one thing I need to make peace with is the fact that sometimes I might not get something 100% accurate. In fact, most makers out there won't be because you're actually having to rely on other people's opinions. And also, when it comes to franchises like Star Trek The Next Generation, when it ran over seven years, sometimes props would get damaged, they'd be remade, they'd be repurposed. And so unless you're basing your replica on a specific prop from an auction site, then really it's not going to be 100% accurate. However, it's really important that you love it. It looks like something that you want it to mimic. And in fact, that everyone gets enjoyment out of it. And that's the whole reason why we do what we love. So you may be asking, what am I basing my research on? And in fact, I'm not basing it on one source. I'm cross-referencing three reliable sources. The source one is Prop Store. So it's an auction house where they had one of these Type 2 phases and they had fantastic photographs of them. Also, I'm cross-referencing with Roddenberry's example of a Type 2 phaser. And who made those phases? The man himself, Michael Moore, the prop maker who made the props of Star Trek Next Generation also made the stock for Roddenberry's. That's right, so you can't get more accurate than that. But the issue is, these are photographs, and the issue of photographs, it all depends on the lenses that were used and the angles, because the same shot, the same distance can look different depending on the lens. Sometimes they could be longer, they could be more squash, so I can't rely on that. So I need to cross-reference with measurements from an auction house. Also, Diagrams, yes, I know, diagrams are drawn, that's not the actual prop itself. However, that's gonna be the most accurate proportion image of that picture because it's not gonna be distorted because it's a drawn picture. So I'm gonna use a piece of reference from a book, which is this, and cross-reference with the photograph. Oh yes, you heard me right, Michael Moore. If you don't know who he is, he was the guy who made the props of Star Trek, not just Star Trek Next Generation, but Voyager, Deep Space Nine, the movies, and many, many other film productions outside Star Trek. And in fact, if you want to, you can actually click on the link below where I interviewed him about his experience as being a prop maker and also the highs and lows of that career. So if you want to get into that industry or you just want to find out about his experiences on set, by all means, click on the link below and you'll get to see that really riveting interview. Step two, generating a prop in a computer environment such as Fusion 360. Now I'm not going to go into great detail in this segment because I'm not an advanced user. I would say I'm more of an average slash novice user because I've only been using it roughly for about a year. In fact this is the kind of thing you can produce at this level. In fact if you just click on the link below and you want to learn how to use a package like this that's the channel I use to be able to get to this level. And believe me, if I was able to do this, I guarantee you can with persistence and just determination. Now, if there is something about this particular prop you wanna have a bit more detail about how I made it, such as, let's just say the ribbed handle bit, which I found quite difficult, but I managed to do it, just leave a comment down below or just message me directly. I'll be happy to explain all the details, the in and outs of how I came about making this. For those that are a little bit intimidated with 3D model making in a CAD environment, don't be. If you can trace something like this, 
then you can make it into three dimensions. You just have to know some of the tools. Now, what you can see here is a top part of the phaser, and that's actually one from Prop Store. So it's a photograph I've actually imported into the program. Now, I've actually got two versions of this. This is a diagram version, because as I've mentioned, if I just zoom in, if I look back at the Prop Store, now we know, especially if you know your phasers, that is sloped, so that's going away from you. So these measurements here are not accurate where it's more than likely that the drawing or the diagram that you have is going to be more accurate because it's a diagram. It's not made into three dimensions, so there's not much of a perspective to actually deal with. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not going to be 100% correct. As we can see here, there's a curve coming out, whereas in the picture, there isn't. So this is where you have to use artistic license and where it's going to be fun. Just enjoy it. You don't have to be 100% just so long you get the general feeling that this is the phaser mark II or any object that you're trying to make now that's how i will start so if i just zoom out here so i've got a number of different pictures for the top view which i can go and reference to and i've also got the side so if i just move it like so there's a side so that's a very low resolution there but that's not a problem because i'm just using it to get the general shape and here's another version of that right there. Now, I don't think it's exactly the same one I'm actually making, but it's good enough. It's giving me the idea of the shape. So to illustrate what I'm talking about is, as you can see here, I just outlined the outside of the phaser, which was pictured before. And then if I just scroll across and what I did next, there we go, I just extruded it and slowly it's becoming a phaser. Now you're wondering actually this is just a block, it's not actually a phaser because it hasn't got that boomerang shape, hence the fact it's called a boomerang. And if I just scroll it again to the next steps, there we go. So what I did between there and there, I just outlined the side profile of the phaser and then cut across. And there we go, that was easy as that. None of this was modeled individually. That was just by tracing two outlines from the top and the side and then intersecting them. And this is what I got. That is brilliant, it's so straightforward. Anyone can do this. And then the tricky part is actually making all the details afterwards, which I'll go through step by step. The best way I can describe at this stage is a bit like a marble sculpture. So I've got my block of marble here and now I need to start carving into it and adding the details. And the more I add, the more complex it's going to look, but I need to tackle it bit by bit. So at the bottom here, I've got a history bar. So I've already made the model. I'm just going back and filming this. And if I click on this button, I can show you step by step how I built this 3D model. Now, if I just click onto it, you can just see I added some fillets on the sides because as we know with Star Trek everything's comfortable and pleasant and nice so there's really very hardly ever any sharp edges so I've added those now this is where it gets tricky I needed to make yes the ribbed part of the handle so what I did I cut out a section here using all different types of measurements and also uh, basing it on the pictures that I had and then I added a separate part so this bit is all separate because I wanted to plan ahead and that's the important thing when you're making models in a CAD software like this. You need to work out at what stage when you need to actually make things separate because it's going to be harder later on to take it apart. Here is where either the battery or the Arduino Nano was going to be. As you just saw there, I added a fillet and it's starting to look like the handle we all know. Now if I just scroll further on the history, you will eventually see me cut this apart. Now, as we can see with the phaser, it's got those ribbed sections all along, those nice rubbery looking rib sections for grip. Now to do that, what I did, I just made these ribs going from the, the top here all the way at the bottom and separated by so many ribs. So I counted how many ribs there were actually on the Roddenberry's phaser, I think it was. And then I cut into this handle. So it looks a bit like a boat, how it's been made. And that's essentially how it was made. Now, after that, each one of these was its own object. So it's now all, these are now all separate objects, which meant I can start shaping them like so. There we go. So it's slowly coming into shape. Now, I know there's a million ways to skin and cat. There really is when it comes to drawing, uh, when it comes to 3D making, actually anything to do with creativity. 
you can do things a number of ways and still get to the same result. And then the only difference is, is which one's more efficient. Now, as I said before, I am basically an average slash novice user. So there's no doubt people watching this right now saying, oh, you could have done that much faster. No doubt I could have done. Um, actually, I just skipped the step there. Let me just go back. Uh, the next thing I added was the top cover. So I treated this as a separate piece because I wanted to have this as the option to be able to remove it so you can see the inner workings. How cool would that be? Now, I don't know if I was gonna do that later. I'm not too sure, but it's at this stage where it's important to give yourself as many options as possible because you might need them or it's gonna be a real hassle going back in time and actually cutting things out and just making them all separate again. So I made sure every part of this model was going to be separate just for options sake and what you see here is the panel for the buttons so there we go I just added the panel I added some nice fillets on the side then the holes for the buttons and then I added the buttons. Each one of those is individual so you've got the main one and the two little ones up there which go up and down the scale after that, I concentrated on the muzzle. So this was gonna be a separate piece as well. It didn't have to be a separate piece, but I wanted, again, options for the future, just in case it's easier to paint later individually, or if I want to do something really funky with the wiring later. But again, always making things separate. It's at this stage things become really fun was when you actually start adding the really tiny details that start making it look like the final product. And again, it's all about adding more of the details, such as the panels on the top, which again is really fun. And also the hole where the light bar is gonna be, where it goes up from stun to kill. The difference between a CGI model maker and someone like myself, where we wanna make things via a computer and make it real, is that it's got to function in the real world, which means if I just give you an analysis, essentially, if I just cut in half, this is a solid. So this is what you're able to do. You're able to cut this in half. Well, not cut it in half, but get a view right down the middle of your prop. And you can see with those hatch lines, this is a solid. However, you have a function in a 3D package like this to be able to actually hollow it out. And that's what I did here because there's got to be space for the electronics. So that's what I had to do. So I think I gave about three or four mi uh, millimeter skin all the way around the entire uh, model because that's a nice solid size when you think it's gonna be made out of resin. And there we go. I just had to tweak it over and over again just to make it hollow so it can fit everything in there. Jump to the three quarter view, and yes, it does look a little bit messy with all those sketches on there. But if I just get rid of those, there we go. There we are. Now I can actually see what this might look like when it's 3D printed. In fact, it will look like this. Um, so there we are. So let me just go through with you of how this is made and all its components. Now let me just turn these off, and we can go through them one at a time. So first off, you've got the main body. There we have it. So this is the main body of the phaser. It's hollow, there we go. And as you can see, I made location points for the other parts because that's, a, that's something to bear in mind because I can spend some time trying to make sure everything's lined up, but you know what it's like. You use some glue, things slip, and then it sets and it's like a little bit out and you're gonna have to sand it and fill it. However, I thought ahead and actually made sure I put location points just as you would do IKEA furniture. I know I've compared my lovely prop to IKEA furniture, but to be fair, it's good quality and it's useful. Then I added the handle cover, the notorious ribbed handle cover. This was going to be the hardest thing to make in this package, but I'm really happy how this turned out. And I know that some of you out there may be counting those ribs and saying, oh, you're too over or too under, but to be fair, I don't think anyone else is going to really notice, uh, but I was really happy how that turned out. And then there was the top cover, and there we are. I made that as a separate entity. Now, I was going to have that as something that flips open, but I'm not too sure now because of the way it's made. It's going to be, there's lots of restrictions of how the hinge would work. And also, it's going to be so jam packed for the electronics. There's nothing going to be interesting to have a look at in there. So I don't know. I'm just going to leave that as it is. Next thing after that was the control panel with the buttons. Uh, yet that turned on with the buttons as well, but I can just turn those off because they were separate, like so. There we are. So each button is separate. 
and they're going to be printed separately as well because they will be on top of their very own micro switch so there's going to be three switches under that then I have the muzzle. Yes, the iconic part of the phaser is the muzzle. It's just beautiful. I really like this. This was very difficult because you've got multiple angles working here. So, and I've made space for a red LED. Now I may change that later. And that's a great thing about programs like this with their history at the bottom. I can actually edit this later on. So go back in time, change it, and it will change everything else. And what would I replace it with? As you may be wondering, because you'll probably say, oh, you're gonna replace it with a laser or something. Yeah possibly if you're a teacher but I might use an addressable LED because then I can change colors and also they're much much brighter than the standard shall we say six millimeter red LED but I'm just using that for the time being then after that is the micro switch and what do I mean by that so these three buttons will need to be pressing down on actual buttons to make the electronics work which are three micro switches so to see that I need to cut it in half so you can see what I'm talking about so there's one of the buttons so this is right down the middle here so and there's the other button that's the main back one there so how are those micro switches going to be placed in here because there needs to be resistance for these buttons to press down on them so then I had to make a micro switch board there we go so there's a board there there's a location for one of the micro switches so when this button goes downwards it will hit the micro switch and then action whatever wizardry I actually tend to place into this phaser so that's the internal workings now it's not looking too bad at the moment but we'll just see how it goes when I start fitting things in there so the way I see it let me just bring it here the speaker is going to be around about here facing downwards Obviously the red LED is going to be at the muzzle. Then you've got the three micro switches with the buttons. Then you've got the Arduino Nano unit, which is either going to be here or in the handle with the battery. Now the battery is a nine volt battery and it's going to be a tight squeeze, but I'm going to investigate if there's any other batteries which are flatter and rechargeable. And actually because this is a Nano and I'm actually wanting a sound with this, I need to have a place to uh, put the SD card, which has the sound effects on them and so that device will possibly be up here in this section so yes it's all of a tight squeeze but I reckon it will work and we'll give it a go after I've printed do you know what this is that's right it's step three this is the term of captain's dry dock let's make it real is actually quite poignant because all the STL files are now uploaded onto this USB stick we're going to plug it into my 3d printer and see it come to life I can't wait Despite what my fiance says, size does matter, especially when you're trying to print a prop like this. Because as you've seen in Fusion 360, I had to slice up the model so I can fit it on this bed. Well, there's actually a bigger version of this 3D printer. This was my introductory 3D printer in regards to resin. Igloo has actually brought out one called the Saturn. And I recommend that if you're into prop making because the bed is slightly bigger and higher, which means you won't have to cut up your 3D model just for the sake of printing it on something as small as this. Now that all the parts are printed and cured, I cannot be happier with the results. They're sharp, it's crisp, it mimics everything I designed on Fusion 360, and I cannot be happier. Now, some of you who've seen my channel before, you know that I own a filament Ender 3 printer. And in fact, that was big enough to be able to print the entire thing in one go. In fact, many people who have made their own phases, if you look online, they usually are printed as a filament print. Now, there's a good reason for that, and that's because I couldn't be asked with the faff of preparing the surface for paint because as we know with filament printers, as brilliant as they are, there are certain times and places where they're best used. And this at this size wasn't it because it's a small object and I would have had to rub down all those really fine vinyl record type lines across the entire thing and all the additional details I had to make sure I didn't rub them off and yeah it would have just taken me absolutely ages and yes granted it's taken me a while to be able to actually print this cut it up on Fusion 360 and whatnot but I've got a perfect product there's no errors from too much sanding too much filling and as you can imagine after a while being a maker, you've had enough with the Bondo and the dust and the masks. So it's just nice to be able to get a part like this, take off the struts, give it a light sanding where the struts are, 
and pretty much get ready to put it together and paint. So that's why I ended up using my resin printer. And yes, there are pros and cons. So with a filament printer, that's gonna be cheaper, it's gonna be lighter, and it won't take as long as printing something in resin, in my own experience. But in resin, yeah, it's a little bit more pricey, takes a little bit longer, uh, and sometimes it can be a bit too brittle. So if I drop this, it may shatter, but I'm not gonna test that, and no doubt, I'm not gonna throw it on the floor. In conclusion, I'm really happy with the results. Now, I would always class my first print as a Mark I because as much as you design and tweak and check things on screen, it's not until you get something in the real world, in your hands, and you can start testing and getting the feel of things actually match up and are right, and any bugs that are in there in regards to actually the wires, where do they go? Can I actually make a little groove in there somewhere to just embed them into the resin? And so what you see here, I would say some of it, I would say the majority of it is actually pretty good. I doubt I'm going to have to do any changes, but one or two parts I may have to go back on screen, tweak, and then reprint, and then pop that in and see if that actually works. So this is a work in progress, but that's going to happen between now and the next episode, because this is part one of two episodes of making the Type 2 phaser. So this part is all about getting all the materials together, the resin print, uh, the electronics, the research, and in part two, it's bringing it all together. Yes, we haven't got to that point of uh, the replicated technology from Star Trek. Instead, you've got to put up with this bald-headed middle-aged man making it with his hands. Step four, or quite possibly in between one and two, because the electronics part of this project, I started almost at the very beginning because it, it was gonna take time to develop. And also I wanted it already before I started modeling the phaser on the computer because I needed to make sure that everything was going to fit. Now, I did not actually work out how to make all these lovely, weird, complex electronics here. In fact, I employed the help of a gentleman in Pakistan. And how did I do that? Well, through a website like this one, Fiverr. Now, this channel is not sponsored by anyone. This is just some uh, uh, website that I've used. And also there are other websites like this, like People Per Hour that I've used before. And what it is, is you just put up your project, people can bid for it, or you can choose someone, an expert online, who could be based in Australia, the Philippines, or my uh, circumstances in Pakistan. And uh, yeah, they'll make the electronics for you in regards to actually working out the sketch for an Arduino Nano, which I'm using in this project, and also a wiring diagram. And you think it's gonna be quite expensive, but believe me, it's not. It depends how much you value your time. Now, my time is very precious. So when you think about how many hours, how many evenings, the headache of trying to work this out, especially if you're a novice like me, then it just wasn't worth it doing it on my own, when in fact, I can get myself an expert like this gentleman, and he will actually work it all out and I'll have the support as well. And later on, if I wanted to tweak it or change it and then adapt it for a different type of uh, prop, I can do, I just have to contact him and then uh, start a new brief. No, you're not looking at my dinner. This is not spaghetti bolognese, although it does look like that at the moment. And I'm using the low-tech way of pointing stuff out with my trusty chopstick. Now, here we go. We've got the brain here. So that's the Arduino Nano. That's got the sketch uploaded on this. Then next to that, we got the three buttons. These are just chunky test buttons. I'm not gonna use those in the phaser. Those will be replaced by micro switches, which will go under the actual 3D printed buttons that I've already showed earlier. Uh, so two of these buttons go up and down the stun to kill settings. And the third button is the trigger button. And that trigger, triggers off the muzzle flash, which is this red LED, which makes a lovely pulsating red glow once it's pressed. And there we have the nine volt battery. Although I'm investigating to try and find a smaller, flatter one like you see in a lot of cameras, uh, and it will be rechargeable, but this one should suffice and it will actually test out this circuit overall. Then a really cheap uh, speaker. I think this is an eight ohm speaker. Yep, yeah, that's an eight ohm speaker, very cheap. This is the kind of thing you get in almost, I think those Christmas cards that make noises when you open them up. And to make those sounds, I need the sound files. And there's the SD card with the MP3 files already preloaded. The last thing I need to show you is the most difficult part I had to source was this. This is the addressable LED light strip. Now you will be familiar with this. This is what it generally looks like online. This is the most common one. They're around about five millimeters square. So five millimeters across and up and however it's just too big for my project because I need to have two rows of eight 
on my phaser and this is just going to be too big and it's i don't even think it's going to fit so i needed a smaller version now i could use individual leds however the problem is there's only so many addressable points on the nano to connect to the led so if there's going to be 16 leds there's just not enough room on this nano to light that up individually so i needed another solution which was a addressable led light strip all i need is three connections two for power and one wire to actually go to the nano which will tell the strip what to do and when i say what to do i mean it will tell the uh, strip what colors and how many leds should light up every time i press a button now where i got this was an absolute nightmare now i looked everywhere online i looked on google I did amazon i went on ebay i even uh, sent out a message to people in the community and even they found it really difficult to find this part what is this part okay so i got this on a website called wish is basically a chinese manufacturer's website and yes whenever you order something from there it takes around about a month to two months to get to you however you do get it and they have stuff that you can't necessarily get in your own country as well as it being super cheap now i think this only cost me a couple of quid i've got a couple of these and it's basically the same version as what you saw before but very very tiny i think 3.5 millimeters uh for each led so really really small at the moment you see it as one big strip but i plan to cut that in half to make those uh, two rows of eight and then wire it up here's an interesting fact about this strip do you know what this part was made for you know those drone those drone races that you see online well this is what they use to light them up because it's small it's super bright and it's really light as well so that's i think it's called wop racing so that's why i couldn't find it uh, very much on the internet because i had to put in those words to be able to have this come up which came up on aliexpress Yes, I know that voice is not canon to the phaser. There is no voice introducing the operator to the phaser saying it's activated. However, this particular phaser is my phaser and I love this touch. In fact, I'm gonna keep that, but if this was a commission for anyone else, I would actually remove that if they so wished. Now, the voice I wanted to use was Majel Barrett's voice. So the actress who actually starred in Star Trek also did the voices in the computers as well. Uh, however, I couldn't find the exact sentence I needed to be able to upload that into the SD card. So instead, I use my next best option. My beautiful fiance, who's Canadian, because as we know, with the Federation, all their computers have North American accents. Have you noticed that? And she's Canadian, which actually works out really well. So I asked her to read off a couple of lines, and that's the one I chose and uploaded. But I can actually change at any time or completely remove it. But either way, this is my phaser, and that's what I want. Top tip. Now, if you want to keep costs low, you can do with this type of website. So if you look out for experts who just started, because usually when they start, they have to keep their costs low so they can start building up their reviews and reputation. And as they go along, as time goes along and they get more and more briefs under their belt, their costs go up as well because they get much of a better reputation. Now, what you need to look out for is someone who seems to be qualified, but just started on these websites, which means you're going to get expert knowledge, expert help, but the price of someone who's just starting out. If you enjoyed this episode, I'm so glad. It's been so, so much fun sharing this build with you. And in fact, if you want to see the conclusion, part two, by all means, if you haven't already done so, there's a subscribe button down below. And in fact, at some point, there's going to be a little button showing up on the screen here. And you just click onto that and you'll subscribe and you'll get a notification on the next episode here on Captain's Dry Dog. In the meantime, you take care, you stay safe. My name's John Child, this is Captain's Dry Dog, and I'll see you in the next episode. You take care. <laughs>